I'm Steve Chapman. I'm with the Chicago Tribune. And uh, you may wonder what I wondered, which is uh, why the Federalist Society asked a newspaper person to uh, come and preside over a, a panel at a uh, conference of all these distinguished legal scholars talking about constitutional analysis. Uh, struck me, it, <clears throat> it struck me as a little like asking Woody Allen to be your bouncer. <laughs> But uh, after they invited me, it occurred to me that there's a, one big similarity between journalism and constitutional analysis, which is that you don't need a license to do it. In fact, you don't need any training whatsoever. Uh, and I do constitutional analysis all the time. Uh, <clears throat> I've never done it in front of a couple of hundred law students and legal scholars, uh, and I don't intend to do it today. Now, I did manage to avoid law school, uh, but I haven't avoided a legal education, which I've gotten over the phone in uh, hours of discussion with law professors who uh, have been patient enough to explain to me things that would be obvious to any law student in the second week of class. And uh, Dean Bennett, if he's still here, uh, I don't understand how you get people to pay for this stuff when you have so many professors giving it away. <laughs> At any rate, um, we do have a very distinguished panel here today uh, to talk about constitutionalism and originalism. And we're going to start with Professor Lillian Bevere of the University of Virginia. Finding the right answer to the question that this panel has been convened to address is fundamental to a genuine understanding of what our system of government is about. The issue for me and my fellow panelists does not go first and foremost to the merits of particular constitutional controversies. We won't be addressing the fun issues of what actual limits shall exist on federal legislative power or on how the power between the President and the Congress uh, shall be divided in the federal system or whether the 14th Amendment incorporates the, bill, the provisions of the Bill of Rights into a one-size-fits-all set of rules for the treatment of accused criminal defendants or even whether the Constitution is colorblind. Important as these questions are, the issue for us is even more fundamental. Not what should be decided, but who should decide and what is the source of their power to do so, and by what criteria are their decisions to be guided and evaluated. At one extreme, shall it be the justices of the Supreme Court who decide according to their own or some law professors or some law clerks notions of what is good for the country? Or at the other end of the spectrum of views, shall it be the framers of the Constitution, the text that they wrote, and the intentions that they bodied in that text, with the justices of the present Supreme Court acting as their agents to interpret as faithfully and impersonally as humanly possible the document that the framers wrote? As everyone here knows, the arguments that have been put forth either in a purely defensive mode against originalism or in a more aggressive offensive posture in behalf of some form or other of non-originalism or a-originalism are often intellectually sophisticated, sometimes eloquent, usually non-legal, self-consciously eschewing things like formalism, nearly always adorned with almost irresistible rhetorical embellishments. They invoke the Constitution's aspiration to social justice, brotherhood, and human dignity. They insist that adhering to the values of 1789 entails turning a blind eye to progress, and that doing so ignores the transformative purpose of the text. Anyway, they claim it's either too difficult and maybe it's impossible to know what the framers meant by the words they chose, 
or it's just too horrible to contemplate the straitjacket that adhering to the founders' intentions and the founders' commands would impose upon our ability to accomplish a progressive uh, social and political agenda. Stripped of their very considerable academic gloss, the arguments of the non-originalists tend to boil down to this. If the Supreme Court is constrained by an obligation of fidelity to the text of the framers, then we might not be able to get the results we want when we want them. We might have to wait, and we might have to go through channels other than the Supreme Court to secure the right to abortion, gender equality, the right to remain silent when questioned by the police, but not when you might want to be praying in school. And if the non-originalist arguments did not, most of them appear in law reviews and were not, most of them made by law professors, you would hardly have a clue that they were supposed to be part of a debate about legal authority of judges to accomplish these results. You'd think instead that the debate was strictly and purely a political or policy debate about what the law of today should be and that any person in her right mind would agree that once we've decided what we think the law should be today, it follows as the night the day that judges can reach that result under the cover of the Constitution. On the other hand, as everyone here also knows, the arguments in behalf of originalism seldom stray far from the question of the legal authority of judges. Indeed, I would say they're utterly preoccupied with questions of legitimacy of judicial power. That's why they begin from such an uncompromising premise and they end with such an uncompromising solution. The text of the written Constitution is law, right? Right. The Constitution is the sole source of the power of judicial review, right? Right. It confers power upon and thus legitimates the power of the, justice of the justices of the Supreme Court to set aside the acts of the other branches of the federal government and of the states, right? Right. But being the sole source of the legitimacy of that power, the Constitution also specifies the limits of its legitimate exercise, right? Right. Those who argue in behalf of originalism are not prone to talk of brotherhood, of human dignity, moral evolution, adaptability, flexibility, or any other of those neat things. They tend to talk instead about law and about the court's legal authority to do anything. And when that's the framework, when that's the question, Originalism tends to appear, at least to originalists, as uh, Professor Gralia and many others have noted, it appears to be just axiomatic. The, an at the antagonists in the originalism versus non-originalism debate focus on such different issues, with originalists talking in terms of quite uncompromising first principles, while non-originalists unable to accept a regime that places such an obstacle in the way of their ability to achieve social justice today as they define it today, talk in terms of progress and flexibility and most especially of immediate results and of what they want now. When I consider this particular aspect of the debate, um, I'm reminded of a story a friend of mine told me about a conversation she had had with her preteen daughter and some of her daughter's friends. The girls had recently been in a life issues class at school where the topic for the day had been teenage pregnancy, uh, the, the issue of babies having babies. The class had discussed various solutions to the problem. Sex education, of course, early and often. Readily available birth control for the girls, condom distribution at school for the boys. And the girls and the class had had a lively debate about abortion and whether it should be used for uh, birth control. My friend um, listened with interest and fascination to this conversation, and then she put her own oar in. How about abstinence, she suggested. One of the girls said, What's abstinence? <laughs> but the basic consensus seemed to be more along the lines of, get real. 
Originalism is the legal equivalent of abstinence from sex by unmarried teens. <laughs> It's a simple, straightforward solution that respects a command more permanent than that of the moment, that demands self-restraint, that entails delayed gratification, but that is not a permanent roadblock to the eventual legitimate satisfaction of desire. <laughs> As I've already suggested, originalists tend to ground their arguments primarily on a foundation of legitimacy. They seem wedded to this question of principle and to what the law requires. Even when they turn to instrumental defenses, they tend to stress originalism's legalistic virtues of stability, predictability, and clarity. I endorse these virtues, and I think that originalism serves them relatively well. But in the time remaining to me, I want to stress two other virtues of originalism. The first is its integrity, and the second, the deliberate impersonality, and hence the universal accessibility of the decision-making criteria that it supplies. First, integrity. Many proponents of originalism notice and bemoan the discrepancy between what the court does and what its uh, non-originalist cheerleaders urge it to do and what it says it does. And the originalists urge upon the court the simple virtue of candor. As even Judge Posner has noted, originalism is, after all, the legal profession's orthodox mode of justification. And so, originalists say, you should align your practice with your preaching. And to the extent that it continues to condone this orthodox mode of justification, while in fact rejecting its premise, the non-originalist position is irredeemably hypocritical and essentially dishonest. Non-originalists intone along with the rest of us that we are fortunate indeed to have a government of laws and not of men. But whereas they appreciate that whenever the coercive power of the state or of the Supreme Court exercising the power of judicial review is brought to bear, it must be wearing an apparent cloak of legal legitimacy, they in fact seem to have but little respect for law at least insofar as law might be a constraint on the court or on their own arguments about what the court should, must, or may do. I clearly don't have time to develop this theme at length uh, or in depth this afternoon, but I do want to suggest that the hypocrisy of many of the non-originalist arguments, the deliberate masking of their real agenda, the lack of candor, the absence of respect or even acknowledgement of law as a constraint on themselves as well as on others, all of these features exert a corrupting influence on the enterprise, on the very idea of law itself. Thus, in my view, an important function of originalism is to exemplify, to enforce, and to sustain the rule of law. Now let me talk for a moment about the second virtue of originalism, namely the impersonality of its decision-making criteria. In a way, to notice this aspect of originalism is merely to work a variation on the familiar juxtaposition of the objectively specified, relatively determinate, relatively disinterested nature of originalist decision-making criteria and the often arbitrary, unpredictable, unspecified, partisan, subjectively chosen criteria that non-originalists use. Certainly when I speak of the impersonality of originalism's criteria, I mean to invoke all the virtues of objectivity and by implication to, to deplore subjective judging. But I also mean to emphasize the particular importance of impersonality as a characteristic of the criteria that judges use to decide cases. The outcome of any judicial process is supposed to be a function of impartial, that is to say, unbiased and disinterested judges deciding cases based on the evidence submitted in court and the arguments of counsel. Participation in the process by litigants is rendered meaningful by the fact that the, the playing field is supposed to be level. It's leveled by rules. Rules of admissibility of evidence, rules of the relevance of arguments, rules of decisions specified in advance. These rules supposedly constrain all the participants in the game, including the referees who are the judges. 
But when judges don't play by these rules, either because they change them in the middle of the game or because they simply pay them lip service while actually being guided by their own views of good policy, then the game is essentially rigged. Advocates whose cases are subjected to this kind of rigging are in much the same position as voters are when the other side stuffs the ballot box. They are, for all practical purposes, disenfranchised. Their opportunity to make their case, to present their arguments, to persuade the court, are rendered sh chimerical by the fact that the outcome has already been decided and on the basis of criteria they neither knew would govern nor could help to shape. What a charade the judicial process then becomes. How empty its promise of equal justice under law. You wonder why some of the advocates even bother to show up. Although, of course, Woody Allen said 90% of life is showing up. So that's probably why they do it. <laughs> I've recently had the intense good fortune to read a biography of Justice Lewis F. Powell by my colleague John Jeffries, Jr. I'm not here to uh, uh, promote the book, although you might think so after I tell you a few things about it. It's a work of genius, uh, though Powell himself. <laughs> Uh, though Powell himself is a rather uninteresting man, he's sort of too good to be interesting uh, as a person, he was a Supreme Court Justice in very interesting times and as you know played quite a pivotal role on the court when he was there. Lewis Powell is a wise and prudent man, a self-described devotee of judicial and every other kind of restraint, but when he got to the court he became the complete embodiment of the originalist nightmare. He embraced no real theory of the Constitution or of his role as a justice, except that he had to continue to be wise and prudent, or to appear to be, and he most especially had to do what he thought was right for the country. His conscience was his guide, and even though it was a perfectly fine conscience as consciences go, it wasn't much of a guide to what the Constitution setter meant. <laughs> the biography contains many revelations about uh, Justice Powell and how he reached his decisions. One of the most revealing, and I have about 45 seconds left, um, is his, the uh, discussion of, of uh, how he came to vote with Justice Blackmun in Roe versus Wade. He found the decision easy. He would vote to oppose abortion laws because he thought it intolerable that the law should interfere with a woman's right to c control her own body during early pregnancy. Uh, it was also true that his background pushed him to be against abortion. His father-in-law was an obstetrician whose judgment Justice Powell happened to trust. He had a clerk in his law firm who'd lost um, a, a girlfriend to a, a, an illegal abortion and his daughter Molly was pushing very hard on him to uh, vote for the abortion. Plus on the court all the momentum was pro-abortion. The two people who were against it only had the argument that it wasn't mentioned in the Constitution. And Justice Powell thought that the country was ready for it. So he had no qualms about there being any sort of discrepancy between his own personal views and what was good for the country. Um, I worry about what the point would have been to argue the case before Justice Powell, whether you would have tried to tell him that his daughter was wrong or whether you would try to tell him that it was really bad for the country or whether you would have tried to persuade him that maybe the Constitution really ought to have a bearing on the, on the answer to the question before the court. I don't mean to make Justice Powell or his vote in Roe the object of particular criticism. I raise the incident only because to me it is a perfect exemplar of how very unfair it is to litigants who think they're getting their day in court and that their arguments are to a purpose, to have their cases decided by judges who in fact are listening only to their own inner voices and who view themselves as being constrained only by their own sense of what's good for the country. Originalism seems to me much more fair to litigants than this because its decision-making criteria are deliberately external to the judges who apply them. They are accessible to all and they constrain all the participants in the game, including most especially the referees. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Revere. I think we can go ahead and close the voting on the best metaphor of the weekend prize. <laughs> but I should tell the other panelists that we do expect some well-developed sexual analogies in your talks. <laughs> well, if Professor Bevere woke you up, I'm, I'm confident that our next speaker will not put you to sleep. Uh, <laughs> Professor Lino Gralia from the University of Texas.
the Constitution, just as William Brennan wrote in a recent opinion, quote, declares that the majoritarian chorus may not alone dictate the conditions of social life, unquote. On another occasion, he warned against the, quote, unabashed enshrinement of majority will, unquote, and blind faith in democracy. In fact, Justice Brennan almost never referred to majority rule or democracy, except to disparage them. His Supreme Court career can be summed up as one third of a century spent combating democracy. <laughs> and, and protecting the American people from its dire effects. A much more famous statement to the same effect is by Justice Robert Jackson in uh, West Virginia v. Barnett. Our, quote, fundamental rights, unquote, he said, quote, may not be submitted to vote. They depend on the outcome of no election, unquote. That is frequently quoted as an expression of one of the glories of our political system. Most people apparently find such statements reassuring and comforting. Who, after all, wants to have the conditions of life dictated by a majoritarian chorus? or have one's fundamental rights depend on the outcome of elections. The comfort and reassurance provided by such statements is much diminished, however, as soon as we ask the, next, the necessary next question. If not by the majority, then by whom are social policy decisions to be made? And if not on the outcome of elections, on what do our fundamental rights depend? <clears throat> What exactly is the alternative? The quoted statements derive their appeal from the assumption that there is some authority or agency superior to mere human institutions that we can rely on to protect us from adverse human action. The assumption, unfortunately, is mistaken. As the grim and bloody story that is the history of mankind makes all too clear. The unhappy truth is there is nobody here but us, and therefore no alternative to majority rule except minority rule. Talk of rights that depend on no elections serves only to obscure that fact. <clears throat> minority rule necessarily designates some individuals as politically superior to others. Such designation experience shows is bad for the soul, or at least for the character of human beings, it leads the designated to an exaggerated estimation of their wisdom and goodness in comparison to others, the occupational disease of federal judges. <laughs> the genius of the Constitution is that it abandoned the search for a designated political elite, an aristocracy of any kind, and established the regime of self-rule by politically equal citizens in a federalist system. In the past four decades, however, we have moved from the constitutional scheme to a system of government in accordance with the views of a small cultural and educational elite, mostly members of an adversarial culture. And the movement has taken place paradoxically in the name of the Constitution and a supposed constitutionalism. Our form of government, our anti-democratic ruling elite never tire of telling us, is not a democracy, but a constitutional democracy. A constitutional democracy, it turns out, is a system of government that has very little to do with democracy, or indeed with federalism. It is a system in which the most fundamental issues of social policy, issues such as abortion, capital punishment, that issues of life and death that determine the nature of a society, the quality of a civilization, are not decided by majority vote of the people at elections and on a state-by-state -state basis, decided instead for the nation as a whole by majority vote of a committee of nine lawyers, unelected, holding office for life, and serving as the mirror and mouthpiece of the cultural elite. The majority may favor such things as capital punishment, restrictions on abortion, prayer in the schools, neighborhood schools, removal of vagrants from public places, but unfortunately for them, they are trumped by the Constitution. The function of which, after all, as Justice Brennan always pointed out, is to stifle the majoritarian chorus 
The people should be happy, however, they're told, to know that their right to burn the American flag, for example, in public, depends on the outcome of no election. Unfortunately, their right to prevent its being burned, if that should happen to be their preference, also depends on the outcome of no election. It depends on the views of the cultural elite. Those really smart people who understand that burning flags is talking. <laughs> The average person doesn't grasp. That's why you need these people. <laughs> the views that the Supreme Court then faithfully adopts and purports to discover is a requirement of the Constitution. The Constitution, is necessary to remind ourselves, is itself only a product of the majoritarian chorus, of mere human beings. It is not as just as Brennan seemed to believe an inexorable mandate of heaven that he was uniquely ordained to understand and enforce. Its only claim to authority is that it was once voluntarily adopted by a majority of the electorate. Indeed, the 14th Amendment, which for our purposes is the Constitution, does not even have that claim, having never been adopted uh, at all except by coercion. In any event, why should the views of people of 200 years ago or 100 years ago override the views of the majority of people of today? That was a question until Professors Sager and uh, Faber cleared it up this morning anyway. Uh, indeed, why cannot the sovereign people simply assemble in a political convention and adopt a new constitution by majority vote, disregarding the cumbersome amendment process that would limit their sovereignty? just as the Constitution itself was adopted in disregard of the limitations imposed by the Articles of Confederation. These are the central questions of constitutionalism, and I regret I lack time to discuss them. I really do. I could clear them up. <coughs> but it'll be harder after this morning's panel, though. <coughs> the confusion is now increased. Uh, discussion of const but they are, but these questions are almost entirely academic in the American context. Discussion of constitutionalism, indeed, can be misleading or positively harmful, playing into the hands of the anti-democrats, insofar as it diverts attention from the real source of our loss of the power of self-government. It's not the Constitution. It's judicial activism. By judicial activism, I mean, quite narrowly and simply, judges holding unconstitutional things that aren't. Disallowing policy choices of other officials or institutions of government that the Constitution does not disallow. It is not activism in this view for judges to decline to disallow a policy choice, to permit the results of the political process to stand. Constitutionalism, has, as has often been noted, raises the problem of the rule of the living by the dead. Judicial activism raises a very different problem. The problem of rule by unelected lifetime judges who are very much alive. I don't say unfortunately. <laughs> In the American context, constitutionalism presents some, but relatively few problems. Constitutionalism as such. The emoluments clause, for example, regularly presents problems when a president wants to appoint a senator or congressman to another federal post. He said, Hatch, Senator Hatch couldn't didn't get on the Supreme Court because of the Emoluments Clause. The Constitution has also protected us from foolishly electing Henry Kissinger or Felix Frankfurt or Albert Einstein as president. All American citizens, but not native born. The Constitution kept us from electing Ronald Reagan instead of George Bush to serve Reagan's third term. In short, <laughs> In short, constitutionalism is not necessarily a good idea. The framers, however, were wise enough to place very few restrictions on popular self-government, with the result that the burdens of constitutionalism are not very great. Judicial activism, however, has perverted the idea of constitutionalism into a ruse to defeat the federalist system of representative self-government the Constitution was designed to create. The nightmare of the American intellectual is that public policy will fall into the hands of the American people. The function of constitutional law is to keep that from happening. 
The, const the function of constitutional law professors is to keep the American people from understanding that. <laughs> and to perpetuate the central fiction of constitutional law that the Supreme Court's controversial rulings of unconstitutionality are in some arcane sense interpretations of the Constitution. That it is the Constitution, not the judges, which has deprived the American people of the right of self-government. The function of useful and honest constitutional scholarship is to expose this fiction. It's all it's worth doing. This can be done by pointing out that only two things need to be known to fully understand American constitutional law. The first is that it has nothing to do with the Constitution. And therefore, with any real problem of constitutionalism or interpretation, what part of the Constitution do you think Harry Blackman was interpreting in Roe v. Wade? The word do or the word process? <laughs> That's it. That's his, those are his materials. You've got to pick. <laughs> the, second thing you know, the second thing to know is that the effect of rulings of unconstitutionality over the past four decades have been almost without exception to enact the policy preferences of the cultural elite on the far left of the American political spectrum. Whatever the policy issue, flag burning, prayer in the schools, vagrancy, pornography, uh, capital punishment, the ACLU is always better off having it decided by the Supreme Court than having it in the political process, always. Personnel changes on the court may affect the degree, but they will not change the direction of this basic effect, this thrust, this use of constitutional law. In sum, constitutionalism presents the academically interesting question of why a sovereign people would ever try to limit their own policy-making authority, and indeed whether it is possible for them to do so if they remain sovereign. Judicial activism presents the very different and crucially important question of whether and how we can return to the federalist system of government by the people that the Constitution contemplates and that it is crucial that we, we return to if we are to escape the socially destructive policies that judicial activism has imposed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Gralia. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, our next speaker abandoned Chicago uh, to go into voluntary exile in uh, the wilds of upstate New York, uh, even though it's nearly impossible to get the Chicago Tribune there. <laughs> but we've managed to lure him back, and we're happy to welcome uh, Professor Jonathan Macy of Cornell. Thank you. It's very nice to be back here uh, in my uh, abandoned hometown and particularly to just be on the same panel with my former colleague uh, Cass Sunstein and my former colleague Lillian Bevere and Lino Grali also. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. I was asking I th someone down at the Federalist Society what this, uh, what the uh, student symposium was going to be about this year, and they said, well, um, originalism. And I said, well, I know it's about that every year, but, but what is it really about? <laughs> And um, thinking about this uh, idea of originalism, it makes a lot of sense, really, that, uh, uh, that this is uh, uh, an appropriate time for originalism to come to the, to the fore. Of course, the reason that people like uh, Steve Calabresi and uh, David McIntosh and Lee Lieberman and Spence Abraham and, and Gary Long and a few others started the Federalist Society, as many of you know, and if you don't, you'll be told this repeatedly this uh, weekend, uh, is because at that time, uh, in certain law schools, the idea of, of, uh, of uh, expressing conservative or libertarian ideas was really uh, uh, out of bounds, that it was sort of outside the realm of permissible uh, per, uh, uh, educational discourse, because only kind of dumb people talked about conservative or libertarian ideas. Um, and as all of us 
to here today fully understand that notion is gone. The Federal Society has really quite succeeded in its mission with respect to uh, changing the prevailing uh, winds of, um, of, uh, of uh, academic thought. But um, with respect to originalism, some of this old vestige still remains, I think. That is to say, in, in many, uh, among many cadres of constitutional law scholars, the idea of being an originalist is town amount to being some sort of uh, uh, intellectual uh, uh, luddite of some kind. It doesn't really have the same kind of intellectual respectability. So I think this is a good idea for a conference to, to, to uh, address this issue uh, head on uh, in a way. Uh, and what I want to do is to um, uh, turn the basic argument against originalism uh, on its head. Uh, and very simply to say that the basic argument against um, originalism is that it can't be done, that you can't avoid being an interpretivist. You can't avoid uh, being someone who uh, twists text to meet your own particular needs or the needs of changing time and circumstances. And that's a very powerful argument that lots of very smart people have leveled against originalists. And what I want to say in my uh, talk about constitutionalism and originalism is that the same charge can be leveled at the anti-originalist or the interpretivist or whatever you want to call them, which is that you can't avoid originalism. Uh, and having said that, it may be the case that the, the schism between these two sides of the originalist on the one hand and the, uh, uh, perhaps we'll call them the interpretivist on the others, isn't really quite so great. And let me begin by um, talking about constitutionalism and its relationship to originalism. The first thing that I want to point out is that constitutionalism is, of course, an ism, like socialism or fascism or communism or, more happily, capitalism, in the sense that uh, it refers to a philosophical orientation um, that relates to social ordering, a commitment to hierarchical, uh, to a hierarchical approach to law which, uh, in which the interpretation of the Constitution is, is considered to trump other more transient values and norms. Uh, and I think Gerald Gunther has it absolutely right uh, when he argues use that judicial review, which is what uh, Lillian Bevere was talking about, is not a natural or inevitable outgrowth of constitutionalism. That is to say, it's perfectly possible to have a constitution without judicial review. Um, that is, you can have a government uh, that, uh, in which we have it as a norm that the government cannot exceed its constitutional powers, but that doesn't answer the question of who is to decide whether the government has exceeded its constitutional powers and when there is a conflict um, with the Constitution. But to me, um, while Gunther is right about this, he's asking the wrong question. That is, the better question is, assuming arguendo, i.e. assuming we live in a post-Marbury against Madison age, um, that we have judicial review, what is this, what are the implications of that for textualism? Uh, and uh, uh, something that I think is important to recognize with respect to sort of latent arguments uh, about originalism is that absent judicial review, uh, or excuse me, I beg your pardon, absent um, uh, originalism, absent originalism, judicial review is much, much harder to justify. That is to say, if you think about the basic arguments in favor of judicial review, they stem from the fact that judges are supposed to be independent, that they're supposed to be insulated from the vagaries of interest group pressures and the day-to-day -day political process. Um, uh, and, and the idea, though, is that if you're an anti-originalist and you really want the Constitution to evolve, to reflect current patterns and prejudices, if you really want it to be dynamic, why do you need judges to be independent? Uh, that is to say that the stability norm for having judges be quite independent is, I think, uh, inextricably related to the idea of um, to the idea of originalism. Similarly, the basic criteria that everybody, 
uh, thinks, that is everybody from uh, Larry Tribe to uh, uh, Michael McConnell, I would venture to say, sort of agrees uh, about the selection criteria by which we choose judges. These people, are, I suspect, will disagree about who meets that selection criteria. But in the event, uh, these people all agree that we ought to look for good lawyers, people with judicial temperament, people who uh, uh, are able to reason well using common law methodology. Now, this would not be the selection criteria we would think about for protect for selecting judges, whether we're Larry Tribe or, or Michael McConnell, uh, if we weren't originalists of some kind. Why, why, if we weren't originalists, if we were going to be interpretivists, why not just uh, uh, pick the best philosopher that you can find or the best um, economist that you can find? Why do we want lawyers to be judges unless we are uh, unless we are um, uh, originalists so that that basically my my idea is that um, uh, that um, judicial review is extremely difficult uh, to to justify in our system without some manifestation of um, of originalist so the idea is um, that again I would ar argue that we are all originalists after um, a fashion that is to say that the very act of engaging in constitutional interpretation, whether by judges or law professors or legislators, is being is the act of being engaged in, a, in, a, in, the, in an act, however abstract, um, of figuring out uh, what the framers' wishes were. Uh, that, uh, and, and, and that by doing, it, and when I say that, what I mean is that what we're doing as, um, uh, in applying constitutional uh, interpretation or implying judicial review is recognizing that the Constitution is the supreme uh, law of the land, and in doing that, we're invoking constitutional values that stem from an originalist conception, quite obviously. Uh, uh, true, those who embrace the idea of a living Constitution and pur purportedly reject the concept, much less the teachings of originally, originalism, assert that the framers' own Constitution exerts much less gravitational force uh, on policymakers than originalists would assert, but that's all they assert. Uh, in other words, the difference between originalists and non-originalists is only a matter of degree. And to see how this is true, consider the following. Those who reject originalism reject it only occasionally, I would argue. They fully embrace originalism whenever the originalist methodology generates results that they find congenialist. That is to say, the non-originalists will say, you know, the result generated by um, uh, originalism are bad somehow in this context, so we're not going to use them. Uh, because we have to have a, a, a living constitution that evolves and changes to meet changing circumstances. But the implication of this analysis is that the original doctrine has undergone, by choice, by necessity, or perhaps by subterfuge, a variety of permutations. So the current incarnation of this document um, differs in their view uh, in important ways from the first, but still the current incarnation is derived from the first incarnation. And I don't believe that any anti-originalist or textualist or interpretist or, or critical legal studies person or nihilist would deny this, uh, which means that, uh, again, <coughs> we are all realists, uh, excuse me, we are all originalists, and the only question is, uh, uh, is one of degree, which brings up the next question, uh, which is the one, uh, I think, uh, quite a good question, that, if you will, the other side, the anti-originalists have, uh, have raised, which is, well, originalism is really not particularly useful because it doesn't really constrain judges. In fact, it's, it's really bad, uh, uh, the other side uh, would argue, because not only does it not constrain judges, but it allows judges to do whatever they want under the guise of being constrained by this seemingly neutral doctrine called originalism. Um, uh, and I, in my uh, view, uh, the, the 
kind of most pernicious form of this argument is the one made by Ronald, Ronald Dworkin, who seems to say that originalism is no good because it's not an absolute constraint on judges. He argues, for example, in his uh, very interesting essays in the New York Review of Books, um, sort of bashing Robert Bork, um, or at least Robert Bork's um, brand of originalism, uh, that his method of argumentation is basically to, to parade out a series of examples uh, where cases where Bork's approach could yield indeterminate or even willfully imposed results. Um, the, uh, the problem with this analysis, in my view, is that it succumbs to what Ronald Coase has characterized as the nirvana fallacy, the nirvana form of analysis. In other words, it's not enough to say that originalism does not perfectly constrain policymakers. Um, what what uh, is uh, the critical question is whether originalism constrains policymakers better than the next best um, uh, better than the next best alternative. Um, uh, and so in, in order for some variant of originalism to prevail, all one has to show, and I think this is more or less consistent with what Lillian Bevere was, say, was saying, is that it acts as, as, as a partial constraint. That is, it's a better constraint than open-ended uh, uh, open um, uh, interpretivism or dynamic readings or the other various forms of, uh, of alternatives that, uh, that uh, come up with. So in other words, the best defense in my view of some kind of originalism is that it constrains, checks, guides, judges better than these other alternatives, which don't even try, of course, to guide judges. Uh, and that is the appropriate standard by which um, originalism ought to be uh, ought to be um, uh, ought to be measured. Let me conclude by saying a couple of words about what, uh, in my opinion, is at stake in this debate. That is to say, why do we have this debate about uh, as between the originalists uh, and the anti-originalist. Uh, uh, um, uh, and and I, I suspect that uh, we ought to recognize that people on the other side don't like originalism for the same reason that originalists don't like uh, uh, judicial activists. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the reason for that is because uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the other side finds the positions, the substantive positions generated by this method of interpretation uh, to, be, uh, to be odious. That is to say, if you look at an originalist position in the Constitution, you go back and see what the, the sort of prevailing frame of mind of the framers were, uh, they strongly believed in private ownership and, and free enterprise. They, they, con they constructed the separation of powers, the system of checks and balances, judicial review, uh, in order to protect things like property rights. Uh, and I think that, um, uh, that, uh, that really, uh, at, at bottom, that's what uh, this debate is about, and, and that originalists ought to be, uh, uh, ought to be um, uh, honest about it, just as the uh, anti-originalists ought to be uh, uh, honest about the results-oriented approach of, of their positions. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Macy. Uh, and our final speaker is uh, Professor Cass Sunstein at the University of Chicago. Um, thank you all. It's uh, a pleasure to be here for many reasons. One of which is I see uh, over the room people who I've known at uh, extremely diverse stages of my life, um, from students who were students in my very first classes at the University of Chicago uh, to people who I read as a student. Uh, but I won't identify them. I might embarrass them and make them feel less young than, in fact, they are. Um, so uh, thank you for having me. These remarks will come in five parts. I have five five claims, five theses, and I'm going to allocate three minutes for each of them. <laughs> uh, first, no approach to interpretation is self-justifying. Any system of interpretation needs a justification. 
In that sense, and this is very much in keeping with the spirit of uh, Professor Macy's talk, personal judgments are unavoidable. To this proposition, originalism is not at all an exception. It needs a defense of some sort. Those who find originalism attractive must mount a defense in terms of some account of the right or the good. References to legitimacy and political authority don't supply that defense. They are question begging. In the end, any system of interpretation needs to be backed by a claim that that system, more than any other, will make for a good system of constitutional law. There is no way of avoiding our own judgments on that question. Second, constitutionalism American style has 20th century, under 20th century understandings, two fundamental goals. The first was the principal thesis, I think, of Professor Revere's talk. That is rule of law values. There's an intimate connection between constitutionalism and rule of law values, to wit, the protection of stability, certainty, predictable expectations, limits on official discretion, including prominently limits on judicial discretion. That's a fundamental goal of constitutionalism, American style. A second goal of constitution was Professor Gralia's emphasis, interestingly different, complementary uh, to Professor Bevere's, and that is a democratic argument, where on this view, constitutionalism attempts to furnish the preconditions for democratic self-government. Our system of constitutionalism in its best form has the rule of law, and democratic self-government at its foundations. Three, I think that too was less than three minutes, so uh, we've got a little more time than I had feared, but I just lost it. <laughs> <laughs> three, there are two forms of originalism, hard and soft. Hard originalism, which is the more famous, is unacceptable. For the hard originalist, what we are trying to do is go back in something like a time machine and ask the framers very specific questions as to how they ought how we ought to resolve very particular problems. The hard originalist view is the dominant theme of Judge Bork's book. Justice Scalia sometimes speaks as if he is a hard originalist. Hard originalism is an unacceptable project because it is inconsistent with too much that is both settled and worthy. In the area of free speech, religious liberty, racial discrimination, and sex discrimination, the problem with hard originalism, putting the epistemological problems to one side, is not that it's indeterminate, it's that it would result in an un unacceptably narrow set of liberties in the United States in the 20th century. There have been heroic efforts to show that the framers' conception of religious liberty, race equality, sex equality, and free speech speech is acceptably ample. These heroic efforts are, I believe, not just heroic, but also a bit comic. We ought not to be fooled. It's not the case that the framers' conception for the hard originalist justifies the set of results that even those most suspicious of rights-based constitutionalism, most suspicious would find necessary. The fact that hard originalism is inconsistent with a minimal approach to free speech, religious liberty, race, and sex equality is important because recall thesis one, any system of interpretation depends on a justification. That justification must, broadly speaking, be, have a connection to whether it would make the world better or worse. Words like political legitimacy and political th theory won't do the job. This is why hard originalism is very, very hard to defend in principle. On what account, I ask, would hard hard originalism be better than the interpretive alternatives. Eastern Europeans, now struggling with the effort to create constitutionalism and capitalism, know that this question is a tough one. In Hungary, the constitutional court, the incipient constitutional court, is not a hard originalist court. It sees that as, uh, as a, 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 an indefensible approach.
Four, soft originalism by contrast is a valuable project and it has great advantages over the alternatives. For the soft originalist, it matters very much what history shows, but will take the framer's understanding at a certain level of abstraction or generality. It matters, as Judge Bork rightly argues, that the First Amendment for the framers had a big connection with democratic self-government. A political conception of the First Amendment is defended in significant part by virtue of the fact that that was the framers' understanding. A conception of the Equal Protection Clause that takes out from the history a ban on second-class citizenship in the United States, that is a defensible interpretive strategy. It is a desirable interpretive strategy. It helps orient our inquiry. It does not run afoul of the problems faced by hard originalism, and it it's much better for rule of law reasons and for democratic reasons than, let's call them, non-originalist alternatives of the sort defended by Ronald Dworkin and practiced on occasion by the Warren Court. Five, and finally, it would be very good to converge, if we could, on soft originalism recognizing the gaps in the concept as I've presented it here. It has a big problem, that is its incom incompleteness as a theory of interpretation. Incompleteness that suggests that it has only a partial connection, as I've described it, with the values of constitutionalism. Soft originalism needs supplementation. Our practice at its best in the United States has two supplementary devices, neither of which uh, should be foreign or incompatible with Federalist society aspirations. One supplementary device is Burkean, and the other is Madisonian. The problem with soft originalism from the standpoint of the rule of law, the first goal of constitutionalism, the one emphasized from Professor Bevere, is that the soft originalist identifies constitutional aspirations at a level of imprecision. How is it that we can have a system committed to the rule of law in the face of that fact? We don't have to look terribly far, as Burke saw the great legal uh, achievement of the English system is the common law, and our system of constitutional law is in significant part a process of case-by-case -case development, where the rules that the Constitution sets forth has an, have an origin. The origin is not principally in particular understandings of the founders, it's principally in rules developed by the Supreme Court over generations and generations and generations. Our rules come from case-by-case -case development, Burkean style, and that's where the rule of law under our constitutional system has its principal vindication, not by particular understandings of the founders. What about democracy, the point emphasized by Professor Gralia? Here I agree with Professor Gralia that judicial restraint is highly desirable. What I'd like to suggest is that we've had too little of it and that the source of judicial restraint ought not to be principally or at all in hard originalism, but ought to be instead in more self-consciously democratic or to be a little more precise, Madisonian considerations. This is a suggestion that the supplement to soft originalism ought to be an account of democracy or republicanism that sees a judicial role as passive, restrained, except in cases in which the argument for a judicial role is insistent by reference to Madisonian considerations themselves. Now we can have a lot of debate about what that particularly entails. That was John Hart Ely's project. I'm suggesting that a version of that project is the right way to pursue the democratic aspirations that uh, good Madisonians have, noting that dem democratic was not a word that uh, Madison was, was thrilled with. Let me suggest that the Burkean and Madisonian qualifications to soft originalism are far more promising than hard originalism, which, mis which is really a misguided surrogate for the constitutional values of the rule of law and democratic self-government. Soft originalism, thus supplemented, brings out the underlying judgments more clearly and more honestly, and most important, it does not rely on question begging and in the end, I think, impenetrable claims about legitimate authority. Thank you.
you. Thank you, Professor Sunstein. Uh, we're going to take questions now. So step right up to the microphone and uh, please say your name. What you start? Mark Smith, uh, New York University School of Law. This is a question for Professor Grolium. Aside from legislation allowing three senators from the state of Wisconsin or perhaps a 25 year old to run for the presidency and be elected, is there such a thing as unconstitutional democratic legislation? And if so, what would it look like under your theory of constitutional government? Um, so that's a question that's been asked me before. Uh, once by uh, Nina Totenberg uh, on a TV program, she said, but Professor Gralia, according to you, nothing's unconstitutional, which is actually a misstatement of my position. I say nothing is unconstitutional that actually occurs. Uh, I could imagine lots of kinds of so I told her I says and she said she said could you give me she asked me your question she said could you give me an example that if you were a Supreme Court justice and I could hear her mumble under her breath God forbid <laughs> you would hold unconstitutional and I said she, by a state law and it was very much like your three senators from Wisconsin perhaps. Uh, I said, no problem if a state should uh, pass a law saying women can't vote. Because I wouldn't want to pass on the merits of that, but it's unconstitutional. <laughs> I knew she'd enjoy that too. Uh, as you know, it's unconstitutional. And, and she sputtered. She said, but, 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 nobody would pass that law. And I said, of course, they can read. <laughs> That's why unconstitutional laws don't occur. Indeed, this is the central objection to originalism. It was the essence of what Professor Sunstein said. What exactly he said, quite openly, frankly, originalism does not make enough things unconstitutional. That's all. It just so happens the Constitution makes very little unconstitutional. I mean, of course, it doesn't, the, the idea that Bill of Rights applies to the states is totally fictional. And take that away, you know, you have the 14th Amendment it was meant to give certain basic rights to blacks. Well, who can live under a regime like that? Professor Sunstein? Lord, no, he'd be in the hands of the people. <laughs> and you would not get the ACLU's program. That is, as he says, that is the essence of the objection. It, we, it does not provide for nearly enough rights and liberties. Because our rights and liberties, thank God, depend on having people like Harry Blackman and, and uh, William Brennan in charge. That's what these people believe. Why do they believe that? Because those are the people that are the voice of the cultural elite. They're their voice. Do you realize that the ordinary people would have capital punishment, prayer in the schools? Incredibly unenlightened policies all over the place. <laughs> and the only thing that is protecting us is the Supreme Court. And if you had originalism, we wouldn't have these protections. And therefore, originalism is bad. Can, can, I, can I ask at this point, I, I don't associate that. <laughs> I don't like what the ACLU says about the Constitution much either. But I guess I want to ask you, wh why uh, want to be an originalist? Well, that was your other point, and I didn't want to uh, take too much time and answer everything. <laughs> he said, began with, that you've got to justify whatever your theory is, whether it's originalism or non-interpretivism or what. And my justification, I thought by the way the Professor Bavier gave a few justifications for originalism that I thought were fairly uh, uh, impressive, but most, most basically to, to say that you are interpreting a document is to say you are attempting to understand the communication of the author of the document. There really is no other meaning that, to interpretation. Again, that actually is false in terms of <laughs> in terms of dictionary definition of interpretation and philosophical, legal, and historical understanding. So you well, can't really retreat to the meaning no, I, of the word interpretation well, because that word has multiple meanings. I say, look, we could, that that could be an interesting discussion. If we came to a beach. As we, uh, for example, uh, Michael uh, Penn, uh, uh, Michael Walters, Penn Walters says, you came to the beach and you saw the word uh, look like help was on the sand, uh, from the uh, in the sand or by twigs. And he says, oh my goodness, let us uh, be concerned. Someone is uh, having a problem. Then you realize he says, no, actually it was just formed by the wind or the waves. You say, oh, it's meaningless. Well, why did the word help become meaningless? 
because it only had meaning, the only thing that changes meaningless marks to words is the assumption that a human being is using to communicate. Without that assumption, there is no distinction. So I believe that to, to, to engage in the project of communication and the use of language is to work on the assumption, whatever other de definitions we might find in some context in the dictionary. The essential meaning of, of communication is that one human being is trying to make contact communicate with another. And words and written and spoken, that's their function. And when I am interpreting what she said to me or what she wrote to me, I'm trying to understand what she meant. If I'm not doing that, I don't know what I'm doing, but I don't believe it is useful to call it interpretation. So we don't need any more just, but you don't want to win this by definition, you know, that, that's just what interpretation means. You've got to be more basic. The whole notion is that we can usefully state rules in words that will determine later human conduct. That's the notion of law. And, it, and if that's the notion of law, and if you accept that that's a useful and possible uh, exercise, then it crucially depends upon the appliers of these rules attempting to determine what the creators of the rules meant. If, if I may say, I think, um, I, I think you've made some good points about the need for judicial restraint. But I, I, I want to say to everyone here who thinks they're an originalist that the grounds for their originalism ought not to be uh, this one. Uh, Hume said that you can't get an ought from an is. And you can't get a normative theory of interpretation from a claim that interpretation or communication is an X when that claim is palpably false. Now, it may be that a speaker's intention, understanding of interpretation makes sense in certain contexts when one is talking to a friend ordinarily. And it may well be that it makes sense in the context of constitutional law. But then one has to explain why it makes sense. And I think Professor Bevere did that a bit in talking about the rule of law. And I think uh, Professor Gralia did that a bit in talking about democracy. But um, but Cass, what can interpretation mean other than attempt to understand what the communicator is trying to impart? Well, you can try to interpret something by making the best constructive sense out of it. A lot of people in linguistics have that conception of interpretation. Now, you may On the assumption that that's what he probably meant. I no, take it. absolutely no? not. Even in though fact, we know it's not what he meant and it's still interpretation? For linguists, the view that you should interpret a text by reference to the meaning inside the head of the person who spoke is highly controversial. For Scalia, uh, that is not only controversial, but flat wrong on the ground that Scalia following Holmes says we do not ask what the, the words the speaker intended, we ask what the words mean. Now we might think that a way of figuring out what the words mean is, has to do with figuring out intentions. But, uh, and you know, I, I guess I, I, I think that the, if I may say with apologies, the weakness of what you're saying ought not to be taken to be disqualifying to originalism, even in the hard sense, because there are arguments for originalism, which would say that it's the hard originalism. It's the best way of limiting judicial discretion and opening up democratic processes from judicial abuse. Uh, but from these words about you, the word communication, you look that up in a dictionary and you won't get the word speaker's meaning yelling out at you. And if you look at people who work on the subject of interpretation and communication, this is not, um, I mean, the notion that you have one of a number of possible views, that's right. But the notion that you have the view of what communication is, it's just wrong. Uh, I, we should move on to something else, not prolong it indefinitely. But I, I don't think I, I don't think, I don't think I disagree with with Scalia, for example. Oh, I, I do, in his refusal to to look at legislative history, but but not fundamentally. That is, he is saying that uh, when it is a public document, we must assume that the authoritative issuers of this document were using the words in their most ordinary accepted sense. But I don't think that deviates from that's the basic. Not speakers. I don't that's think, not speaker's meaning. Right. Well, we assume that the speaker is using the words in the most ordinary sense ordinarily. I take it if we know that the speaker was not using the words in an ordinary sense, if we happen to know that this particular contract maker or will drafter, perhaps more importantly, had an eccentric meaning, understanding of some word, that the appropriate interpretation of the will 
would be give it, to give it the meaning that we knew the maker of it meant to give it. That is interpretation. Now, uh, with all respect and not uh, being totally wrong about something and all that I apologize for having to tell you, uh, the, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't believe that ordinarily you can make sense of communication, of, of the enterprise of law, of writing rules in words. It's, so you can't usefully make, make that a useful enterprise except on the assumption that the person who writes them is authoritative and those words should be understood to have the impact, the function, the role that the authoritative issue what intended. Uh, unless either of our panelists wants to jump into this. Uh, Are you kidding? Uh, well, my role is sitting in between these two. I hope my role in this panel has become quite clear now. In terms of sitting in <laughs> my name is Bob Steigman. I'm from Urbana, Illinois. <clears throat> I'd like to ask a question and put in somewhat different context on this construction. <clears throat> Uh, men and women currently are uh, working in Congress and in the state legislatures to uh, pass laws to reflect the policies uh, that they think should be achieved. And in the process, they are using uh, uh, the English language and the ability to set this forth in statutes, essentially the same tools that uh, we have uh, to write constitutional provisions and the same tools that were available 200 years ago and in the Civil War amendments as well. Uh, my question is, what principled distinction exists or should exist in interpreting statutes as opposed to interpreting constitutional provisions to divine the meaning of what these statutes are? And let me put it this way, uh, in directing it to Professor Sunstein, are you a hard originalist or a soft originalist on statutes? Well, uh Closer to a soft, but not quite either. I think Justice Scalia for statutory interpretation has it mostly right. That is, we should take English words in their ordinary language sense and, um, and interpret them um, in a way that would deviate from that only if two things happen. One, there's good reason to believe the contextual understanding is different from the ordinary understanding, or if two, there are uh, principles of interpretation that the legal system endorses that cut hard for or against one view. I'd emphasize that, that latter point more than Justice Scalia would. What I'd say about the difference between statutes and constitutions is it has, it, the distinction has to do with the level of generality at which the text is written and the length of time since the relevant provision was enacted. Would it be appropriate to find emanations from penumbras of statutes? I don't want emanations from penumbras from anything. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think Griswold was a terrible opinion. And uh, as a privacy opinion, I think it was wrongly decided. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I'd, I'd give you the Sherman Act, where... Please don't. Uh, where the... the uh, I mean, interestingly, Judge Bork uh, did not think it was very important to figure out with respect to the Sherman Act specifically what the drafters of the Sherman Act intended. But instead, with a statute that's, that's written at a certain level of generality and that's very old, a kind of common law-ish process can get us what orig hard originalism is intended to do. Basically, what Judge Bork says about the Sherman Act is my view on constitutional interpretation. Can I just add one uh, follow-up with respect to your question? I would say that you're, it's a very good idea to say, well, should we interpret the Constitution the same way as we do statutes? I think perhaps even a better approach would be to say, should we interpret the Constitution in the way that we do contracts between two uh, fully informed uh, consenting commercial parties? And the reason I think that's a better method of getting at um, uh, the, the, the uh, reasoning methodology is because I think that in, in the contractual example, there's a lot of consent between the parties. In the constitutional example, there was a lot of consent between the parties. But in the context of ordinary day-to-day -day legislation, and the famous adage from Bismarck comes to mind about not wanting to watch the legislative process any more than watching sausages be made, is that this is not the same kind of consensual process from the people, that is the statutory process that you were describing, uh, that in my judgment, uh, because of problems of information costs, interest group politics, rational ignorance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that the Constitution was, which I view as a much more consensual document and binding for that reason. <laughs> 
I think just a minor point that I cast, but I think the, uh, the analogy to Sherman Act is not a good one because I think the correct interpretation or understanding of the Sherman Act, as best you can make it out, is probably simply that Congress was ju just giving policy jurisdiction to the courts. So there is nothing more to be found. You say, well, what were the courts supposed to do? The truth is, you know, perhaps not shockingly, there's not much information on that. It's true Jeez. that many communications can be gibberish or uh, simply be, uh, why don't you people do something about this area? Now that, I think that's probably, that can, can be controversial, but I think that's probably the best interpretation of the Sherman Act. I've actually read the legislative history of the Sherman Act. I don't recommend it. Um, uh, and that's not what they said. They did not think that this was up to the judges to solve a problem. They talked a lot about how important it was that uh, businesses be small and how bad largeness was. And there was some stuff also about uh, economic efficiency. There was a lot of progressive slash Brandeisian rhetoric. Now, I think what Judge Bork says is, Pretty old, it's very hard to make that judicially administrable, and uh, the efficiency criterion is a lot better way of making sense out of things. Whether or not you think Judge Bork on this has taken too hard an anti-originalist line, uh, your description of the Sherman Act's history, ju just this is, just happens, it, it wasn't that. Let me just say one other thing. I think it's very important to keep in mind the difference between the Constitution and legislation. I mean. Um, with le judicial interpretation of legislation, you do, you do not have in spades the kind of problem to which Cass was referring and which certainly bothers me a lot of, uh, and which I think originalism is essentially, um, and hard originalism is, is basically addressed to solve, and that is of arbitrary uh, judicial power. And the reason you don't have it is that when the legislatures, when a statute is interpreted, if the court gets it wrong, it can be overturned. Now that's in some respects too easy an answer because it's the inertia, the ball is in a different court, there may not be political momentum and so on and so forth. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to overturn statutory interpretation, but it is not anywhere near as hard, and besides, in principle, legislative supremacy exists with respect to statutory interpretation. In principle, it doesn't exist with respect to the Constitution. So you could certainly justify, in principle, different ways of interpretation, it seems to me. Uh, hi, Ak Akhil Amar. Uh, I have a question for Professor Bevere. I very much agreed with a lot of what you said, so I tried to think hard on what someone who didn't agree with your conclusions might try to say. And let me just float that and invite your, your reaction. One thing you said I think is very revealing uh, in your series of right rights, uh, you uh, said that basically originalism is the foundation for judicial review. We have judicial review because the text and the history of the structure of the Constitution so provide, and if that's the basis for it, then shouldn't the limitations on that power also follow? And I think some people who disagree with your conclusions might disagree about that premise. You know, uh, they, they might say, well, we have judicial review in part because of case law. Mike Moore this morning said, or this afternoon in the first panel says, there was a case decided on that. Actually, there have been, there have been a few. So that's an argument from doctrine, which might be seen as a sort of a kind of legal argument. Uh, Dan Farber uh, in the first session said, well, you know, some things are just kind of settled and stable. Cass Sunstein appealed to things that are just settled. Um, and judicial, uh, uh, Alex Bickle says you can't change judicial review any more than you can change the course of the Mississippi River. That might be an argument from sort of a p political prudence uh, of sorts, they're just uh, stability. Uh, I think Larry Sager's account of judicial review is judges are likely over the long run to get it right. That's, of course, what I think Lino Grawley disagrees with, but a more straightforward argument from almost natural law or a, a justice argument. Here's what's interesting about those accounts. Um, they too claim the mantle of legitimacy and law. Um, they claim to be impersonal, to be objective. Um, Dan, uh, Dick Fallon tomorrow may talk about arguments other than text history and structure like uh, prudence or, or um, natural law or, or doctrine. Philip Bobbitt calls all of those 
legal arguments. So I think we've got this tradition of natural law where you do try to uh, judges under a natural law tradition. They try to be objective and impersonal. Um, we've got a tradition of common law that tries to be incremental uh, and uh, take doctrine and, and, and precedent seriously. If you basically believe in the text of the Constitution itself, the argument is you're actually going to have some big instabilities because maybe a lot of what we've been doing deviates from the best understanding of the Constitution. You may have some indeterminacy there too because thoughtful people will disagree about what the best reading is. So I, here's where at least Professor Garley, a, sub, a supplement to you may be a little helpful. It may very well be in thinking about constitutional law, we have to think not just about law and legitimacy, but what's distinctive about a constitution. Why constitutional law might be different from common law, which has sort of features of legitimacy and objectivity and impartiality, or different from natural law, which might have certain features, again, of uh, in the aspiration, objectivity, and impersonality. So I just wanted to invite you to, to sort of react to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my first uh, uh, reaction is that um, there's a big difference in my view. It's a separate question. Um, originalism is a different question from what we do about the precedents we, we're stuck with today. And thank God I'm not on that panel. I don't have, I'm not going to do that because I think that's terribly difficult. Th then you have issues of social stability and you have issues where, I mean, I know what Gary Lawson thinks about precedent and, and I think that, um, you know, a hard originalist would say, well, I get, we just have to overrule them all. And that's a very difficult position for me to get to. So I think that those are two separate questions. Um, the, um, you know, there, there's nobody more than Justice Powell, for example, who would claim to adhere more um, solidly, stolidly, with more um, fidelity to the kinds of values of stability and, and so forth, and fairness and justice and so forth. The, the problem was simply that that in, in the context of him doing it, they're just words. They're just his view of what those mean. So in part, what originalism and textualism does is provide a sort of coordinating function for the way we think about and for, for the sources of stability, of impartiality, and so forth. It gives us all a place to look. Now you're right that it may be indeterminate. My view is it's probably less indeterminate than the alternative, certainly less indeterminate than how it was that Justice Powell came to decide Roe versus Wade. So in the sense that, you know, it isn't a perfect solution, but the fact is that it get, if we can all look in the same place, then we're all on the same page and, and we all have the same opportunity to affect what it is that the court does. And we can also have the same opportunity to go to the legislature and try to change the result there. So I think the best that, I could do. that we are so totally sucked into this fiction of interpretation and how to interpret and maybe natural law as a way or common law methods that we just keep can't forgetting that there's no issue of interpretation involved. Nothing is being interpreted. You know, when I said the Constitution is the 14th Amendment, that's hardly an exaggeration. Maybe 98% of the cases are state cases, and maybe 98% of those cases purport to be 14th Amendment cases. You know, so that there's nothing, it isn't like you think of, well, you have to interpret the Bible. Boy, that's tough in the Talmud. But, but not the words due process. If that's all that's being interpreted. You really have to say something other than, there's not, nothing that should be called interpretation of all. There is no issue of interpretation. You don't sit down and say, now wait a minute. Did the Constitution really, does the 14th Amendment really deprive the states of the right to restrict abortion? Does it really deprive the states of the right to provide for prayer in the schools? The point of the First Amendment was to insist that the federal government would not interfere with the states on matters like that. And here we're all deep intellectuals. We keep talking about interpretation. We can't get over the fundamental central truth of all this. There is no question of interpretation. Nothing is being interpreted. This is all, the only issue is, should these decisions be made by people like Marshall and, uh, and Blackman and Brennan? When they sat down there and says, oh boy, here's a constitutional question. Uh, can the states prohibit sodomy? 
Well, let's look at the old constitution and do some interpreting, okay, guys? No, forget that image. No, that isn't what happened. No, no. Instead, Marshall and, and Brennan look at one another and say, what do people like Cass Sunstein think about this? <laughs> Yes, I wish. So, uh, if, if that's a call for a response, I guess. Uh, uh, I, I think from Professor Crowley's earlier remarks, on this point, they were correct, which is that interpretation pervades the exchange of words. So the notion that words aren't interpreted, that can't be what's meant. It must mean that the interpretation is easy, and it may well be. But the notion that there's no interpretation, that I mean, you just heard words which I hope were clear, but you interpreted them. So uh, it's, the interpretation isn't avoidable. It may be that there are easy cases. I think so. We may even agree on what they are, but uh, they're easy for reasons. And those reasons pervade our interpretive practices. Uh, I've lost track of who's next. You? Okay. Yeah. My name's Larry Myers. I'm from Brigham Young University. I've heard a lot about what judges should and shouldn't do. I'd like to know if originalism imposes some type of obligation on legislators and also on executive type officers. If so, what type of obligation and how does that affect uh, our duties as citizens in how we elect and how we act as citizens towards those legislators and executives? Mm -hmm. And any of you could answer, please. That, that's a great question. And um, partly because it shows the split between constitutional interpretation in the judiciary and constitutional interpretation outside the judiciary. And we might think, if we take democracy seriously, that the interpretive practices of a citizen or an elective representative would be quite different from the interpretive practices of a judge because the judge ought to be sensitive to the fact that he or she is unelected and just a judge after all, with a very uncertain position in the constitutional system. Now, I guess this form of what I've tried to defend, that is soft originalism with Burkean and Madisonian features, is not what I'd defend for uh, elected representative. Is Representative McIntosh in the room? interpreting the Constitution. My guess is that Representative McIntosh has a more robust understanding of the takings clause than the current Supreme Court. And uh, I think the current court's understanding of the takings clause, which is um, cautious, is justified if it is for democratic reasons connected with the judge's weak position. But an elected representative doesn't have that constraint. So the Madisonian slash democratic grounds for judicial caution ought not to apply to a citizen or representative. To give you another case, I think the Supreme Court on the various grounds I've stated should be very um, reluctant to invalidate affirmative action programs. But a representative who believes on principle that affirmative action programs are inconsistent with the Equal Protection Clause, rightly understood, should act on that conviction. That's to say there's a space between interpretation as it occurs in the judiciary and interpretation as it occurs within democratic processes. That's because no system of interpretation stands on its own bottom. Anyone has to be defended. And any acceptable interpretation, uh, understanding of constitutional interpretation by judges will be attentive to the fact that the judges are just judges, which is why the case for hard originalism has some force and why whether or not it has force, soft originalists and non-originalists ought, I suggest, on principle, to develop devices to limit the occasions for judicial intervention in democratic processes. Another way to put it is the Warren Court exerts far too large a spell over the nation with the thought that constitutional interpretation is a judicial activity. President Reagan, you know, I have a lot of questions about President Reagan, but some things he did that were really great were to act on his own constitutional convictions with an executive order, for example, on takings, which was constitutionally inspired. We ought to have more constitutional debate outside of the judiciary. <laughs>
I rather have myself have some doubt about whether we should have more constitutional debate. Remember that constitutional debate is essentially a question of a resort to history. And it's, it's not clear that that's something we should want to really much emphasize. For example, you have a question, uh, should New York City have a gun control law? Now assume, you know, erroneously, the Second Amendment is uh, incorporated with all the rest. So now what we have to do, now what we have to do is engage in a historical discussion and as best as we can find out what was really understood by the relevant ratifiers in 1791. Is that a sensible way to go? It really is not or more directly, a federal uh, gun control law. Uh, the, the, the way, the well, first thing we have to do is we need constitutional debate. Well, it should be perfectly clear. The Constitution has its functions and so on. It's a big topic. But the, certainly the, the number one issue should be, is this a good policy? Not the most important thing to do here is to engage in historical research and try to come up with an answer. And again, those who say you probably aren't going to get an answer, make this as an objection to originalism, uh, are of course quite often right. But the answer to that, which is ignored, is if there's not an answer, then it's not unconstitutional. You know, this is again what's, what's, what's so easily forgotten. If the court cannot say, Yes, if you understand these words, we look at these words. You can't deny the vote on grounds of sex or grounds of race. You can understand those words. We have no reason to think they weren't used to mean their ordinary meaning, which is what makes communication possible. And uh, then if, if, if you can say that a, a law violates these words, then we're gonna hold it unconstitutional, good or bad. I mean, if the federal, federal government passed a law saying the criminal defendant has to take the stand, I think that'd be a wonderful improvement on our system, but it's unconstitutional. It just so happens. That's what it says, that's what it's understood to mean. But in the vast majority of cases, you say, well, we don't know what they meant. Good, then it's not unconstitutional. The only possible justification for a Brennan or anyone else to say that some policy choice is out, is not a permissible one, is that it was authoritatively decided that that policy choice is forbidden. And if they can't say that, it's not forbidden. And in fact, you can almost never say that since the no women can vote law doesn't occur. So, or the, 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 the federal criminal defendant must take the stand, even though it's a good idea, it doesn't occur because Congress knows it's prohibited by the Constitution. And so you wouldn't expect to see unconstitutional laws, and indeed, it'd be very hard to find one. I think you're next. My name is Jeannie Evans, I'm from Harvard Law School. Um, my question is, a lot of people have mentioned uh, on the panel that originalism is limited and it doesn't, not everything is listed in the Constitution and so it leaves out a lot and it's limited as a restraint on the judiciary. But it seems that in light of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, which leave many rights to the states and people, you could see it as more complete. And so therefore the problem comes, I guess my question for you is, as an originalist, how do you decide when a right is left to the state or to the people? Because um, under the Ninth and Tenth, a lot of the framers, they felt like the 10 amendments were not all of the rights constitutionally protected for individuals, and that many were left to the people. In fact, many didn't even want to vote for the Bill of Rights because they didn't want it to be limited to what was written down there. So all these rights that are left to states and to people, and so if you're an originalist, how do you decide which is which? For example, you've, a lot of you have talked about the Roe v. Wade case. Um, if you're an originalist and say, okay, there's no right to an abortion or to privacy listed in the 10 amendments, you're still left with the question, is that right left to the states or the people? It seems if it's left to the states, the judiciary has to defer to a legislature who passes a law prohibiting abortion. But if it's left to the individual, the right to have abortion, then the, the court would have to strike down as unconstitutional anything that said you could have an abortion. And so you could either respond to that example or just to the question in general of how does an originalist decide which rights are left to the states or well, I think it would come in the context of a state law which restricts abortion, for example, is the actual way this comes up. Now that comes to court and that's challenged as an impermissible policy choice by a state because the superior United States Constitution has disallowed that policy choice. So that's the question. Does the Constitution disallow the state from making that choice? 
And the answer is really about as clear as we can ever expect anything to be in human affairs. No, the Constitution does not. And that's the end of that case. But maybe I, let me just clarify, I'm sorry. Um, because <laughs> if the right is left to the individual, because it says in the ninth or the 10th, but the 10th, that these rights are left to the state or to the people. And so if it's left to the individual, then making it illegal would be violating a constitutional right. Well, can so I just break in here? And I, I think the problem in communication here is as follows. Someone who's a strict, and I'm on your side in this, but I think it's good to get this difference out as clearly as possible. Someone who's a really strict originalist would not agree with you that such a dichotomy between the will of the state and the will of the people is possible. The idea would be, well, this, this, the state has passed this legislation that reflects because this is a democratic process, uh, the will of the people. And in my view, it relates to this, this previous question about you know, what does originalism mean for uh, ideas about legislators' views of the Constitution. I tend to side with you because I think it's ridiculous to take the view that whatever some state legislature happens to, uh, uh, whatever rule some state legislature happens to generate, or Congress, for that matter, on a particular day, accurately somehow reflects well, the people Gallup polls do a better job of that, you know. Uh, and the idea, my point, um, is that the, the, the constitutional, the interpretive style that we adopt or the strategy that we adopt, whether it's hard or soft, intrusive or not, is going to have a lot of effect on our everyday lives because it's going to affect how, ef how efficient, how, how sensible it is for us to lobby. And if we're living in... Uh, uh, in the world that um, that Lino envisions, maybe it's for the best. I'll leave that. Uh, I'll, it's quite clear it is, right? That um, <laughs> if we're living uh, in that in that world, um, we're going to spend, I would suggest, a lot more time lobbying because whatever we happen to get today in the legislative process is really going to. Uh, uh, to, to make a big difference. In this way, I think it's instructive to spend about 10 seconds thinking back to Robert Bork's Supreme Court nomination hearings. And I think it was quite instructive that the, what was going on there was really that uh, 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 Bork was taking quite an originalist perspective. And the Senate's reaction, just on a human level, was quite revealing. They said, Ooh, this, what we do is really disgusting. You know, that is generating all these laws. We really need a court that's going to strike all this stuff down as unconstitutional. He's saying, oh, no, I'll let you guys do whatever you want because it reflects the will of the people. Biden, said, oh. Biden said, my God, that's us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I, it seems to me that uh, that in this sense, uh, uh, you know, perhaps Biden and Kennedy were a lot more uh, realistic about sort of how um, uh, un unappealing the, uh, the outcomes they generate actually are. I would say I would say two things. One in response to uh, John, you know that ama that amounts to that uh, there's an improvement on government by the people, and and it's not clear. And government by the people is one hell of a bad thing. There's no question about it. You know, as Churchill said, government is is a problem, uh, and you know all life is just a question of of bad choices. Uh, and uh, <laughs> unfortunately, and all, all that's be said for anything, including being alive, is the alternative. Uh, the um, so so there isn't much to that. That uh, you know, Gallup polls do it better, or, or legislatures don't always reflect majorities. Of course, there's endless problems, but it, that that's not an answer to probably any attempt to do something other than have self-government doesn't seem to work well for for historically and for understandable reasons. Your question, though, Miss, it seems to me, if the court said, now there's an individual right here. That what we're saying is the Constitution, through the Ninth Amendment, Tenth Amendment, or some provision, has actually given the individual a right on, say, abortion. And so when a state restricts abortion, it's acting unconstitutionally because it's violating that right. That's what it'd be saying. And I'm suggesting that, realistically speaking, there's no grounds for saying that. There is no useful way, or realistic way, it seems to me, to say that, yes, that's what somebody intended to do. And to say that, well, we're going to rely on the Ninth Amendment is simply another confusing way of saying the unenumerated rights idea. As a realistic matter, it means that the justices get to make the policy. And that's all that's involved in this entire constitutional discussion. Is it better that certain basic social policy decisions, which turn out now to be an enormous range, be made by these nine lawyers instead of through the democratic process with all its faults? And as I think Lillian said, as someone said, you know, Plato recommended rule by philosopher kings, so obviously you can favor such a system. 
But I don't think anybody who favors rule by lawyer kings. Why lawyers? <laughs> Whose philosopher is Harry Blackman? I think we're going to take two more questions, and you're next. Ariel Axelrod, University of Southern California. Um, Proceeding on the assumption, as uh, Professor Bevier said, about trying to get some type of systemic stability whereby we have rules whereby parties can understand what the rules are and that um, you know, abortion isn't going to be legal in one state um, 10 years ago and 10 years from now, or, or even now, and then 10 years from now it's going to change. Proceeding that we want some desirability and we want to get rid of this philosopher king uh, syndrome, then it seems to me um, that the only way to do it um, with some of the um, problems that Professor Sunstein's pointed out uh, with you know soft versus hard um, originalism is to go more of a textualist approach simply going with the content and, and not even taking context because it seems to me that if you go context there's there's two problems first if you go context with 91 ratification of the Bill of Rights um, then you have a context of there were still state established uh, establishments of religion and so if you take that as a context then you look at that and you say well then surely as some have argued uh, in recent days, then uh, state establishments of religion would be okay and not prohibited by the Constitution. The other thing, and so what I want to address is this. The, the problem again with originalism, is, and then I'll get back to where I want to address, sorry. Um, I've been sitting here for about half hour. <laughs> um, is that the other problem with originalism is it seeks to understand, or original understanding, as opposed to textualism, what they meant as well, and it seems to me that you can't ask the dead hand of the framers what they meant um, on one issue when you want to start asking, you know, who do you ask? Do you ask the uh, the ratifiers? Do you ask the 1,750 participants in the 13, you know, states what what they understood it as? So it seems to me that the only answer becomes a textualist approach, looking at the meaning at the time. And I wanted the, the uh, panelists to address that. I agree with that. Thing. Everybody else agree? Well, I, I didn't understand. I thought maybe you meant the priority of the text to the context, and then at the end, I thought you meant the text as originally understood. Do you, do no, you I was trying to point out that both context and original understanding had negative attributes, whereby textualist approach, seeking to understand it simply within the definition of the time, provides the only basis whereby the stability, you know, see, seeing that Professor Bevier's idea of, you know, systemic stability as a desirable goal, that that's the only way to provide it. I guess I would, I see a possible dichotomy between text on the one hand and original understanding on the other. That would be the view that we want to know what the text means, not what the original understanding was. That would be a possible dichotomy. The dichotomy between the text at the time and the original understanding, maybe the panel's just missing something, or maybe just I'm missing something, but that seems to me not so, so clear a dichotomy. What, what's the difference between the text as originally understood and the text as understood at the time? Okay, what I'm saying is not going by the text, I'm going by your idea of looking at, you know, trying to, you know, the communication break uh, dichotomy that you had with uh, Professor Gralia, that you look at the meaning at the time of the dictionaries. In other words, you don't look at how the judges understood it, you don't look at how the ratifiers understood it, you don't look at how Madison understood it. You look at what did the words mean simply from a dictionary standpoint. And you take all these other actors out of the picture. Well, I mean, we want to see what came out of that. It might be that the dictionary would have some bad surprises. And uh, I mean, the virtue of originalism is it purports to be connected with democratic considerations, what actual we the people actually thought. And your suggested approach, we need to think more about it, but it's not connected with, it doesn't have the virtue of originalism. And whether it would impose constraints is also not so clear, because the dictionaries probably for words like equal would have big gaps. Maybe not, but then we want to ask whether the results of the dictionary definition were ones with which we could live. And some people might think that's not an interesting or relevant question, but my suggestion is that has to be. Let's hear from Gary. Uh, 
Very. All right, I'll ask the, the shorter of, of the two questions I had in mind to Cass. Ask them all, Gary. As you know, Cass, I agree entirely with Sunstein's first thesis about the need for a justification for originalism if you're going to use it as a basis for decision making. The same, of course, is true of anything else that you intend to use as a method for decision making. The short question is, what is the default value? What is the default method of decision making if nobody is able to demonstrate that their conception of the right and the good meets whatever criterion of consensus is required? Let me, let me um, just, I know that, that Lena will have the answer to this, but let me, just, uh, <laughs> let me just say from the perspective of the approach that I was taking, Gary, um, and I was hoping you'd ask a question because it's not really a federal society event unless you have a question, but um, is that one of the revealing features uh, of uh, this debate, in my view, and one of the reasons that I have come to the conclusion that I've come to, which is that there isn't very much sunlight between the originalists uh, and the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the non-originalists, is that the set of circumstances where we observe the necessity for the default rule you're, uh, you're hypothesizing is zero, right? Why is that? And the reason for that is because these you know, people have an answer that they're reasoning to, right? It may not be informed so much by originalism. So I think, it's, I think your question is a great one, but it's the reason I think it's such a great question is because it, if I may say, supports the, the thesis that I was advancing, which is you know, it's quite amazing that we don't ever say, gee, we couldn't figure this out. Think about contracts cases. There are lots and lots of contracts cases where the courts absolutely acknowledge immediately. These are contracts cases drafted by, where the contracts are drafted by lawyers getting paid a lot more than the framers were, right? Saying, we couldn't figure out what the parties meant here. We're gonna have to sort of put ourselves in their position and reason backwards. It's quite amazing we see that so much in contracts. We don't see it in constitutional interpretation and quite revealing, I think. Now again, remember, in constitutional interpretation, if you can't say that it's forbidden, it's not. I mean, that's the difference. And they're interpreting a contract. They, the court has to reach a decision from one party or the other and do the best they can to figure this out. That's but true again, in constitutional no, no, in, no, no. In constitutional interpretation, the question should Somebody be: wins these cases? You know what I'm that, saying? That's right. And democracy should win unless the Constitution has trumped it. So whoever is now, claiming, now is that, can I ask: Is that your view, or is that a historically been the case? That is my view. Yeah. <laughs> you'll, you'll hear the historical oh, view tomorrow at 11. Sweet me then. Okay, that, uh, on that I agree with you, but then we're... Then we, uh, I, I didn't mean to... I agree with you both that that's your view, and I agree with you that... Uh, I agree with your view. That is that uh, we ought to have, if we need a quick shorthand, we ought to have a democratic default rule. Uh, but then... Um, then we have to figure out what that means specifically and what sort of content to give it. And then we aren't talking about what communication is, capital I-S, or what interpretation is. Cass, it seems to me that a realistic discussion would be a totally open, honest, realistic discussion of constitutional law is certain questions, certain social policy issues should not be decided through an electoral process but instead should be decided through some kind of a lifetime committee. And maybe you can make an argument for that. But that's the issue. And all the rest is obfuscation. The issue is simply, is it better that whether or not we have prayer in the schools be decided by nine lawyers in Washington for the nation as a whole? That's the only issue. Is it better you take the issue? And instead of this entirely misleading discussion that we're talking about interpreting the Constitution, it's the, if, we were, if we were candid and open and honest and realistic, all we're talking about is, is that a better way to make some social policy issues okay. by this committee? Okay, now you're making an argument from political theory, not an argument from history. And I have you know, sympathy for that argument from political theory, but I think things are much less simple. All right. Uh, I told you we'd keep you awake. Uh, I'd like to thank all our panelists. Uh, we're going to take a break now. Oh.
Excuse me. If I could just have your attention just for a moment, just for a, a quick program note. Uh, my name is Ken Dortzbach. I'm one of the uh, symposium directors, and I just want to remind you that uh, as we break for dinner, uh, we are going to uh, reconvene at 7.45. Uh, the panel then will be, what is originalism? Um, as far as dinner is concerned, there are uh, several options that are listed in your folders. Uh, there are several food courts that are nearby. And you can also stop at the registration desk and ask questions there. The one last thing is, uh, there is a speaker's dinner, and that will be in the dean's suite, which is on the second floor, uh, the floor above where the registration desk is. Thank you very much.